Story continued from Megalania episode. Australia one million years ago, a continent that has been slowly drifting north and steadily getting drier and more arid. Here we find the lone Thylacalea female resting in a tall tree. Though she usually patrols open bushland, her movements have brought her into the more forested areas, resembling the more tropical forests that used to cover the continent. She is resting through the hottest part of the day and is completely safe in the high branches of the tree, but still checks her surrounding for threats and prey. The sound of a large animal moving through the undergrowth rouses her from her slumber. Perhaps a potential meal may be passing right under her. From the sound of the animal, a thylac Leo expects a deprotodon. However, what comes lumbering in her direction is quite different. This strange one-ton marsupial is a Pelocestes, a lineage of herbivores most closely related to wombats. This female is one of the last of her kind. Pelocestes evolved to live in lush forests, but as the environment around them has gotten more arid, they have been reduced to only a few areas on the continent. They are now an endangered species, and may soon disappear altogether. The large female moves her head amongst the bushes and uses her specially evolved prehensile lips to pick up the freshest and most tender leaves. Behind her is her joey, that only recently started to walk around on his own. Like all marsupials, he was born in a pouch, and upon growing too large for the pouch, spent most of his time riding on his mother's back. Now fully weaned, he is having to feed himself, and as he gets more confident in spending more and more time away from his mother, though he still stays well within her sight. One day when he is old enough, the two will simply part ways and likely never see each other again. Right now, however, it is a bad time to be on his own, with the Thylac Leo in the branches above him. The predator above considers her options. She is slightly hungry, but this particular meal may be too risky for her. It is not only the size of the Pelocesti, as she is taken down to Protodon, which are far larger than her. What she is concerned about is the 15 centimeter long claws that the mother Pelocestes has on her fingers that could easily gut any predator that threatened herself or her joey. Though effective weapons, the herbivore normally uses them to strip bark from trees or maneuver branches and leaves towards her mouth. The large female places one hand on the trunk of a tree and uses the other to pull down a branch to access it. As well as prehensile lips, she has a prehensile tongue, much like a giraffe, and eagerly strips the branch of its leaves. The joey, however, continues to move away from his mother and the Thylac Leo begins to move along her branch, sensing that now may be the time to launch an attack from above, something she is specialized at. As the hunter moves to the base of the tree, the young Pelocestes has his head in a bush, but the Thylac Leo is still unsure if she can take down the prey before the mother could retaliate. The young Pelocestes lets out a groan of pain, and both the mother and the female Thylac Leo turn their heads to see what had happened to him, from beneath the bushes and between a cluster of rocks, a huge python has launched at the joey and snared him in his jaws. The snake is the size of a modern anaconda, and just as strong. It pulls the young Pelocestes across the ground and begins to wrap one coil around the victim. But the young marsupial is strong and pushes against his attacker. The python is surprisingly quick for its size and maneuvers the rest of its body outside of its rocky home, ready to constrict its prey but a large shape appears above the two. The mother has arrived, and she is not pleased. Using one of her thick hands, she grabs the head of the serpent and pries its jaws off of her young. The snake didn't give up and continued to squeeze the young Pelocestes, but it was stunned as the mother slammed its head into the ground. She then grabbed its neck with her second hand and twisted. The huge claws on her hands slice through the tough muscles of the python, spreading its flesh between the multiple thick blade-like edges. But she didn't stop twisting. She kept pulling and pushing until the snake's vertebra snapped. With a wet crack, a shiver went down the mighty snake's whole body till it reached the tail, which trembled for a few seconds, and then it went limp. Mother and son reunited, rubbing their heads over each other's neck and shoulders. A dangerous encounter, but both were unharmed. Later, when the pair have left the area, the fight like a Leo finally comes down from her tree and examines the python's long body. It isn't a normal meal for her, but it will definitely satiate her hunger. 
though it is a little too long to pull up a tree, and so she settles for eating it on the ground before other scavengers can arrive. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down possibly the strangest marsupial ever to have lived, Palocestes. Palocestes was a genus of herbivorous marsupial mammals that lived on the eastern side of Australia, between the Miocene and the late Pleistocene. We have incredibly few remains of Palocestes individuals, so much so that the genus doesn't even have a common name. However, you will hear it referred to as the marsupial tapir, or the marsupial ground sloth, which we will get into later. Palocestes was named in 1873 by Richard Owen, who only had a part of the lower jaw, and believed it to be a large species of kangaroo. Hence the name Palocestes, meaning ancient leaper. Oddly, in 1945, paleontologist Howard Fletcher published its name to mean ancient dancer, which isn't that important, but quite funny. With more fossils found, the genus was reclassified in 1958 by Jack T. Woods to be closely related to the diprotodonts, where it has remained. Despite the limited remains, which are mostly teeth, skull fragments and limb fragments, the genus of Pelocestes contains six species. However, some of these species may be junior synonyms of others, or represent sexual dimorphism with males or females being larger or otherwise quite different to each other. The largest, Palocestes aziel, was 2.5 meters long, stood 1.5 meters high at the shoulder, and weighed between 1 and 1.2 tons. This weight was calculated from the measurements of the humerus and femur, making it a short but stocky animal. The skull of Palocestes has been one of the most perplexing features of the animal. It has a long jaw with plucking teeth at the front and grinding teeth at the back, with a deep lower jaw that would have contained a long tongue similar to a giraffe. The large, seemingly open space at the top was once thought to have a small trunk, or proboscis, similar to that of a modern tapir, hence the nickname marsupial tapir. However, more recent studies have shown that this is incorrect. Paleocestes did not have a flexible nose, instead it had large prehensile lips that it used along with its long tongue to feed on leaves. You'll see a lot of art of Paleocestes with a proboscis nose, but this is currently the most up-to-date depiction of what the animal looked like. The evolution of these specialized features indicates that Paleocestes was a bit of a picky eater, going after the freshest leaves, likely rearing up on its hind legs and bracing itself with its front legs against the trees, and plucking at leaves with its long lips and long tongue. The forelimbs of Pelocestes have large claws in them, quite similar to its distant relative, the koala. These may have been used to help it grasp onto branches and move them towards its mouth when it was feeding, or strip bark off of leaves, but they could have also been effective weapons to defend itself against predators. All of these features have led some to compare Pelocestes to a completely different group of extinct mammals the ground sloths from the Americas. And despite being half a world away and evolving under completely different conditions, it is not a bad comparison. In fact, they may have both browsed similarly, sitting on their backsides, moving branches with their arms, similar to modern gorillas or pandas. They share many parallel features, even though one of them is a marsupial and one is a placental mammal. As a marsupial, Palocestes would have been born in a pouch and grew from a tiny joey till they couldn't be held in the pouch, and likely stayed with their mothers till they were large enough to live on their own. Given their size, Palocastes probably only had one joey at a time, and likely had a slow reproduction rate. Like most of Australia's megafauna, they went extinct as the continent became drier, but Palocastes may have been an early victim of this slow change. Based on their specialised lifestyle, they relied on their environment being forested, and as the land turned to bush and grassland, they were forced into the ever-decreasing forests of Queensland, where most of their fossils are found. Despite this, there is Aboriginal artwork that depicts animals that look a lot like Paleocestes, so perhaps some of them survived long enough to encounter and interact with the first humans that arrived on the continent. So, Paleocestes, a great example of the diversity of Australia's megafauna, the last bastion of the marsupials. And for my question of the week, do you see Paleocestes as a low browser or a high browser, as it seems to be suited for both? 
What lesser known extinct creature would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching. Okay, so this is the first time I ever saw a picture of Paleocestes, and I took it from the Queensland Museum, so the quality's in good, but like, just, what? <laughs> Why did they draw it like that? <laughs> Why is it eyes? Why is its eyes like ooh? ooh? <laughs>